Here we go. Continuing on with our talk of Ohm's law, Q equals change in pressure over resistance. Pressure will be the driving force. Blood will only flow from high pressure to low. There are different kinds of resistance that I'm going to tell you about tonight. And by Wednesday night, please do the Physio X that I asked you to do, exercises one through seven. In those exercises, you will go through each exercise addresses, or should say activity, addresses one of the forms of resistance that I'm going to tell you about tonight. I do believe that doing that Physio X, so we can talk about it on Wednesday, will also help you with next week's Lecture 3 exam. It is not a waste of time. That's my opinion. So this is my honey doing something really stupid. <clears throat> I mean, he's a really good fisherman, but he was doing something pretty stupid right here. He was trying to fly fish on the Colorado River, you know, was going through the Grand Canyon, floating down, and he decided that he was going to fish for trout through fly fishing in this very wide, swiftly moving river. And I'm watching him going, because that's not, it was the middle of the day. That's not where trout are going to want to be in the open water in the heat of the day. They want to be behind a rock and the rock would create resistance to the swiftly moving river. If they're behind that rock, they don't have to use as much energy to stay swimming in that river. They can be behind the rock in the eddy. So there were no rocks here. It was very fast moving. That is not where trout are going to be. So two hours of him trying to catch a fish, zip, zero bites. A monkey learns more quickly than he does. So I sat there thinking, hmm, this is a perfect application of Ohm's law. I wonder what is the flow rate of this river? Now, if I say flow rate, this is not speed. This is not velocity. Flow rate is volume per time, unit of time. The volume can be milliliters or it can be liters. It could be in minutes, seconds, hour. For example, cardiac output is a flow rate. It is the amount of blood that is going out of the heart per minute. Did we get that? Stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected per beat. That is not a flow rate per beat. Beat is not a unit of time. So flow rates, whenever you read that, it is volume over time. I will address speed, how quickly blood is flowing through a vessel. Those are different things and they have different units. And I beg my students to know the difference. So <clears throat> we can calculate cardiac output in a few different ways. One classic way is heart rate times stroke volume, which is the equation I asked you to know for tonight's test. And you should still know it for next week's test. But you will see that cardiac output can also be calculated right here with this equation. <laughs> using Ohm's law, cardiac output is a flow, flow rate. You can, you can substitute cardiac output for Q. You could solve for cardiac output by dividing the, the pressure gradient by the resistance. I will never ask you to calculate that on an exam, especially lecture unit three, because in lecture unit exams, there isn't any calculation that you are asked to do. But you should know the equations that go along with these flows, flow rates. <coughs> Did I skip a slide? So some characteristics of ways blood flows. 
Uh, we've already talked about these in great detail. <coughs> Blood can flow in a laminar fashion. That means streamlined, and there's a parabola effect with it. And when blood flows in a streamlined fashion, there is no sound to it. Did anyone, wa anyone watch Saturday Night Live on Saturday? No? There was a sketch in there where Sandra O oh was a substitute teacher. <coughs> And she starts asking them questions about the standardized test. And every student that raises their hand, they go into this really you know, philosophical, deep answer. And one of the students talks about a parabola. And I thought it was hilarious. I'm like, that is streamlined blood flow. Look it up. Watch it on YouTube. Maybe you'll start laughing as hard as Pete Davidson was trying not to laugh, but you can see him in the background just losing it. I like it when they break character, don't you? It's even funnier then. When blood flows in a turbulent fashion, that is when you hear sound. I explained that to you with your four heart sounds. It is not from a valve opening or closing. The valves don't make the sound. It's the, it's the turbulent flow of blood that makes the sound. We had heart sounds that resulted from turbulent blow when valves were open. We had heart sounds that resulted from turbulent flow when valves were closed. So it's not a matter if the valve is open or closed, it's the turbulent flow. Depending on our time frame for tonight, <clears throat> definitely this week, you're going to be learning how to take blood pressure readings from each other. How many of you already know? Okay, then I am going to rely on you all to help your classmates that don't know how. Um, it requires a quiet classroom and you all start having so much fun. You might want to go out in the hallway. And I do have um, one stethoscope that has two ear sets. So you can be the coach and cue your fellow classmate, like, do you hear the turbulent flow? And you can kind of point at them like, now you should be hearing sound. Turbulent flow during blood pressure readings means that you are, you are hearing the turbulent flow during systole, when the heart is contracting. When the sound is dropped, it, that is diastolic pressure. And we'll talk about that in more detail. So the turbulent flow, we use that to our advantage, not just for heart sounds, but also taking blood pressure readings. If there is no pressure gradient, then there is no flow. The blood will not move. Blood will only flow from high pressure to low. So when we get turbulent flow, we get sounds. Um, heart, abnormal heart sounds are called murmurs. Have you heard of heart murmurs? We'll talk more about heart murmurs resulting from faulty valves on, on Wednesday. I almost forgot what class I was talking to. We can, also we can also describe them as bruits. So if you read the word bruit, think abnormal sound. It's like a murmur. Um, we would definitely hear an abnormal sound for any blood vessel that has a um, quick narrowing, that's called stenosis. When blood vessels ha go from pretty large in diameter to a very small diameter quickly, or if the blood flow direction changes very drastically, you can hear sounds. Where would blood flow change direction pretty drastically in your body? One example would be your descending abdominal aorta, the right and left renal arteries come off almost at 90 degree angles. That is a quick change in direction. And as a result, when blood flow changes direction quickly, not only can the flow become turbulent, but it also can cause damage to the blood vessel. And you can start getting atherosclerotic plaques. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment as well. So speaking of this, when blood vessels get damaged, they get atherosclerotic plaques or calcium deposits. Um, it, it's, it starts to look yellowish like this. And this yellow color is frequently a result from macrophages 
that go under the tunica intima live underneath of it, but on top of the tunica media. And what they do is, especially if you have a high level of HDL, which in a lot of classrooms they call that the bad cholesterol. I don't like that term. Cholesterol is necessary. It's all about homeostasis and keeping it within an acceptable balance. So if you have high levels of HDL beyond acceptable range, your macrophages can travel underneath the tunica intima and they start trying to lower your HDL levels by engulfing it. And then they get really big and they get real fatty and we call them foam cells. And that's the reason why they, call this, they, they cause this yellow streak-like effect in the blood vessel. This is not a healthy blood vessel. Another way that blood vessels can become unhealthy with their tunics, this is an aneurysm. And an aneurysm is essentially similar to when your tire, the outer rubber of your tire rubs raw and the inside inner tube that's filled with air starts to bulge out of that weak rubber layer, it's gonna have a propensity to pop. If you hit it just wrong, that tire, it will blow. Aneurysms are the same way. I don't really go into a lot of detail about the different kinds of aneurysms, but if you take pathophys, oh yeah, we do. We go into all the different kinds and which ones you're more likely to live through and which ones you're probably not likely to live through. And then we all revisit one of our favorite actors that died not too long ago from an, a, an aneurysm that dissected, that blew. Do you know who that was? He was in an old sitcom called Three's Company. And when he died, he was, he was actually in a newer sitcom, Seven Things You Need to Know About My Daughter to Date Her, something like that. I never watched it. But John Ritter, super sad. And he was, during taping, on the set, he was complaining of chest pain. And by the time he was complaining about it, he fell over basically dead because his aortic aneurysm just split open and he just bled out internally. There is very little you can do at that moment. They bleed out very quickly. So nitric oxide is going to be an attempt for the endothelial cells to reduce the amount of what we call shear stress. Shear stress is very similar to when water flows over rock. You've, you've seen pictures in this PowerPoint of water flowing over rock through hundreds of years and creating the Grand Canyon. That was stress from water, erosion. When we talk about turbulent blood going across blood vessels, it creates stress on them and it damages them. So endothelial cells in an, in an effort to reduce that amount of stress, they can release nitric oxide, excuse me, and nitric oxide will cause blood vessels to vasodilate and hopefully reduce the amount of frictional rub on the endothelial lining. So let's talk about blood pressure a lab that you will be doing this week. Stephen Hales is credited with, with studying blood pressure. <clears throat> and the way he did it was a little disturbing. He took, he basically sedated a horse. Someone had to stay by, so you see the horse laying down. Someone had to stay by the horse to kind of keep the horse calm. Then he took a large cannula, this is a large needle, and he stuck it into the carotid artery of the horse. And that cannula was attached to a rubber tube, which was attached to a glass column. And when the horse's <coughs> heart contracted, the layer, the, the layer, the level of the blood went up. And he read that level in this column and it was marked with millimeters of mercury basically. And when the horse's heart relaxed, the column of blood went down and he read that level. So contraction, blood 
went higher in the column. It was driven up higher. That was systolic pressure that he read. When the horse's heart relaxed, the column of blood fell. That is the reason why, to this day, we still report blood pressure readings in the same units, millimeters of mercury. So that's what you're going to be doing this week. Now, how many of you know one of the first vitals we take when a patient comes into a clinical setting? It's one of the first things we do. Blood pressure readings. How likely would you be to go for a regular checkup or even go to the doctor if you were very sick, if you knew they were going to take your blood pressure by sticking a large needle into your carotid artery, would you, would you be willing? Yes. Liar. <laughs> so thank goodness we have learned how to develop a non-invasive way to take blood pressure readings. This is huge, very similar to the EKG being non-invasive. We did not crack open your chest, retract your rib cage, and stick electrodes into your heart. Because we stuck them on the surface of your body, that's the reason why we had to reverse our perspective of electrical charge across the cell membrane. So I'm very thankful that we have a non-invasive way to actually figure out your blood pressure. In the next few weeks, I'm also going to tell you how to calculate renal function. It's non-invasive, really. I mean, we draw blood. That's about as invasive as it gets, and we collect urine. But we don't have to stick a catheter up someone's urethra all the way up through their ureters all the way up until their renal pelvis to their major calyces, to the minor calyces, up through a renal papilla, up through a, a medullary duct to a collecting duct, to, and, and then all the way back through the late distal convoluted tubule to the early distal convoluted tubule, down the ascending limb, around the loop of Henle, up the descending limb to the proximal convoluted tubule to the globe. That should be a drunk test, <laughs> don't you think? None of this walking a straight line or saying the ABCs backwards. Officer, I can actually do the, the flow of urine backwards. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> they would have no idea. All blood, all blood vessels have a blood pressure. But the ones, that, all of them do, they all do. But the ones that we are worried about the most are the arteries closest to the heart because the heart is the pump that starts the pressure gradient. Okay, so where do we usually take blood pressure readings? Which arm? Let's start there. Why the left? Closest to the heart. Good, could we take it from the right? What would you expect to find in those readings? A little lower than if you took it from the left arm. Good. Could you take it from someone's femoral artery? Could you put the cuff around someone's leg? What would you expect to get for readings in that region? A little lower. Why? Further away from the heart. And of course, we're thinking of someone laying down, not necessarily standing up. Could we? <laughs> I mean, in theory, could you imagine that? Putting the cuff around the... <laughs> and your patient going... <laughs> and then you release the pressure. <laughs> it is not appropriate, so do not do that to each other this week. I'm just saying... There are other places we could besides the left arm. That one would not be conducive with someone's health, though. In this week's experiments, when you take someone's blood pressure, you're going to be doing this in two different ways. You're going to be using the auscultatory method, which means to hear. That's where you need to use the stethoscope of the ear parts and you're listening for the sounds or the loss of them. The palpatory method means to feel. 
And this is where you are feeling for the return of the pulse to the radial artery. In your lab manual this week, there are questions that ask you which one is the better of the two to use and why. And if a nurse says to you, I took blood pressure readings on Lauren, I did both escultatory and palpatory, and I got the exact same numbers both ways. If you have a nurse telling you that, you should run for the hills. And I want to know why, two reasons why, they are wrong if they tell you that. So when we do that experiment, think critically about why that statement from the nurse would be erroneous, and you should not trust that person. They're lying to you. So when the heart contracts, the blood is ejected. Those elastic arteries and early muscular arteries have elastic tissue that allows them to expand with that stroke volume. Then when the heart relaxes, we get the recoil of those blood vessels. And that means during the recoil, the blood is pushed further down the vasculature. That means our blood still moves through the vasculature even when the heart is at rest. That's a good thing, that your blood flows continuously, unlike the water in your house. It doesn't flow unless you turn on the faucet. If you turn it off, it doesn't flow anymore, correct? Could you imagine if your blood only flowed when the heart contracted? This is what you would look like. Alert, out. Alert, out. Alert, out. You'd lose consciousness in between beats because there wouldn't be any blood getting to your brain. Imagine going through life like driving. No. Alert, gone. Alert, gone. Thanks to the elastic tissue, we get continuous blood flow through our vasculature. Flow equals change in pressure over resistance. <clears throat> What's the change in pressure? The difference <clears throat> in blood pressure in the arteries versus the blood pressure in the veins. Blood flows from high pressure to low. That means, listen, if I want blood to be ejected, I'm going to use the left ventricle as an example. If I want blood ejected from the left ventricle, then the left ventricle has to generate more pressure than the blood pressure in the aorta. And if I want blood to flow from the aorta down, let's say, to the common iliac artery, which then splits into the external iliac and internal iliac, if I want blood to go from the aorta to the external iliac, then the aorta has to have a higher pressure than the external iliac. If I want blood to go from the external iliac to the femoral artery, then the blood pressure has to be higher in the external iliac than in the femoral artery. If I want blood to go from the femoral artery into an arterial feeding one of the muscles in your thigh, then the blood pressure has to be higher in the femoral artery than in the arterial. And if I want blood to flow from the arterial to the capillary bed, then blood has to be higher in the arterial than the capillary bed. And if I want blood to go from the capillary to the venule, are you getting the pattern? From one vessel to the next, the next downstream vessel has to have a lower pressure than the upstream one. If I want blood to go from the inferior vena cava into your right atrium, then the inferior vena cava has to have a higher pressure than the right atrium. We have a full loop through the systemic circuit. Pressure from the left ventricle can be about 120 millimeters of mercury. By the time blood comes back to the right atrium, the pressure in the right atrium is zero. So I can take a pressure difference. In that example, 120 minus zero gives me a pressure gradient of 120. 
Here are two poorly drawn kidneys. <laughs> Blood is flowing <coughs> into the kidney through the renal artery and out of the kidney through the renal vein. In kidney A, the blood pressure in the renal artery is 100 millimeters of mercury. In the renal vein, zero. What's the pressure gradient? 100. In kidney B, look what happens to the pressure gradient. 100 millimeters of mercury for blood pressure entering, but blood pressure exiting through the renal vein is now up to 20. What happened to the pressure gradient? It went down. So tell me what would happen to flow rate through that kidney? Lower. The pressure gradient isn't as high. Your right atrium is supposed to be zero for pressure. Zero. And one of the labs you're going to do this week, you're going to measure central venous pressure. Central venous pressure refers to the blood pressure in the right atrium. It should be zero. And in lab this week, you are going to simulate what a patient looks like if their CVP, central venous pressure, is not zero. If it goes up, then the blood flow rate, cardiac output is a flow rate. Venous return is a flow rate. If you do not have as great of a pressure gradient, you will not get good flow. If your right atrial pressure is not zero, if it's 20, think of that as blood obstructing flow of blood returning to the right atrium. Well then if blood can't return, where will it be? Where's it gonna be? Yes, say it loud. Pulled up somewhere. And when blood pools up somewhere, it starts seeping out of blood vessels. And then you get fluid accumulating in interstitial spaces. <gasps> Our body fluid compartments need to be reviewed for next week's exam. If blood seeps out of blood vessels and into a different body fluid compartment, we're going to see swelling. We're going to see edema. Remember that little girl with kwashiorkor and you were first learning about body fluid compartments? Well, tonight I am going to teach you the physical forces that cause fluid to seep out of blood vessels into the interstitial space, causing edema. If your patient has elevated right atrial pressure, it is going to pool, as Christine said, in the systemic circuit, and they are going to have systemic edema. Guess what's going to happen if the left atrial pressure is higher than it should be? Blood is going to pool, but where? In the pulmonary circuit, and now you've got fluid seeping out not just into interstitial spaces, but into the air sacs, potentially. That's life-threatening. That is now called pulmonary edema. You will not get good gas exchange. That's serious, serious issues that we need to resolve. But just like when I taught you about anemias <coughs> and why we need to know what kind of anemia in order to know how to treat it, we need to know which of the forces caused the edema. If you know which force caused the edema, that's the one you go after to fix it, to remedy. We will practice that. And we are going to do that not just tonight, but it continues on even in Wednesday's lecture when we talk about cardiovascular problems. I have to teach you about the Starling forces. And there is a section in your homework packet that you've probably been looking at going, what the duck is this? And how do I even start it? Well, after tonight, you should be able to start it. So central venous pressure is the amount of pressure in the right atrium. If you read Guyton and Hall, they tell you that we technically measure it 
by putting inside a measuring device like a catheter in the superior vena cava. But it technically is def defined as the pressure in the right atrium. It should be zero, but it can change. If it elevates, you're going to get less blood returning to the atrium. That means less venous return. Blood will pool. Edema will result. There are also times when the pressure can go below zero, negative. That definitely happens when you exercise. It's as if the heart becomes someone sucking on a straw. When you exercise and the heart relaxes, it's like siphoning the blood into it. And you get even better venous return, which makes sense because if you're exercising, you want more blood to return, so you get more blood out to fuel your hardworking tissues. This week, you are going to simulate someone who has an elevated central venous pressure. The lab will take you maybe two minutes to do. But do not let the shortness in the time to do that experiment mislead you. When we actually do central venous pressure experiments, it has multiple layers. There is what we are trying to simulate. Does everyone know what simulation means? There's what we're trying to simulate. Then we have to say, okay, what is actually happening though in you? So what are you simulating versus what is reality? Then I have to teach you about the Valsava maneuver. Then I have to teach you how we can use the Valsava maneuver to potentially have someone who has supraventricular tachycardia convert to a normal rhythm. So there are layers of complexity to that experiment. Simulation, reality, you were using this Valsava maneuver, what are the phases of it? How can we use the Valsava maneuver to help get someone back to a normal rhythm? And there is a chart in your lab manual to help you with that. And I ask you to tell me what would venous return be like, what would cardiac output be like. <clears throat> and then another layer, I have to tell you about the baroreceptor reflex arc. So there's a lot I need to tell you about tonight to prep you for that experiment. There's a lot. So when the heart contracts, we have a higher pressure. Think of Stephen Hales holding his column, watching the blood rise up in the column. And when your heart relaxes, the column of blood goes down, and that's your diastolic pressure. I can subtract the two. I can subtract diastolic pressure from systolic pressure, and it gives me pulse pressure. You will not be asked to calculate pulse pressure on next week's exam, but on lab exam two, yes, you will be asked to calculate pulse pressure. It's simple subtraction. If someone's systolic pressure is 120 and their diastolic pressure is 80, what is their pulse pressure? 40. That's not hard math. <coughs> that should be an easy point on lab exam two. So that's going to be our driving force through a particular blood vessel. That's a pressure difference, right? Systolic from diastolic. Now, what can impact our pulse pressure? Two things. The stroke volume, that means how much the heart is ejecting in a beat, and also the compliance of the arteries that are receiving that stroke volume. <clears throat> we'll focus on the left ventricle. So the artery that receives that stroke volume would be the aorta. So let's talk about stroke volume. If we have an increase in stroke volume, more blood, what do you think is going to happen to systolic pressure? It's going to go up. So instead of 120, it might go up to 140. Diastolic pressure is where the blood vessel goes back to its normal open state. It's all relaxed. That number might still stay at 80, to use my previous example. 
Now what is the pulse pressure? 140 minus 80, 60. If stroke volume goes down, then, oh, sorry, if stroke volume goes down, pulse pressure will also go down. What about compliance? How flexible is the aorta? If it's not very flexible, if it has a lot of mineral deposits like calcium, if it's rigid and hard, then it's not going to expand as well. And the heart is still trying to get that stroke volume out. And now that stroke volume is definitely pushing on that rigid wall. And that means your systolic pressure is going to go up. So again, if your arterial compliance decreases rigid, then your pulse pressure is going to go up. We're worried about that scenario because now that means the blood vessel could rupture or you can actually start to get the intima shearing away from the tunica media. And this can lead to an aneurysm. That is not what we want, a change in arterial compliance. Not when it goes in a rigid way. Now, I just threw a lot of concepts to you. And I could put them in a big concept map. Ohm's law. Flow equals change in pressure divided by resistance. And I'm going to talk to you about resistance. When we speak of resistance, we're talking about resistance everywhere in the body. So total peripheral, meaning outside of the heart, resistance, TPR, total peripheral resistance. Cardiac output can be calculated by multiplying heart rate times stroke volume. Mean arterial pressure, mean pressure, pressure gradient, is the difference between systolic pressure and diastolic, and the difference between those is called pulse pressure. That's your driving force. And pulse pressure is impacted by stroke volume and arterial compliance. You will be asked to calculate mean arterial pressure for lab exam two, not for next week's exam. There are many ways for us to calculate a mean average arterial pressure. In math, you learned what average means. Mean arterial pressure is not a true average. It is not. And the reason is we're going to give more credit. We're going to skew our data towards diastolic pressure, and here's the reason why. In the cardiac cycle, the heart is in diastasis longer than in systole. So you take systolic pressure, multiply by 0.4. It's not exactly half, 0.4. Diastolic pressure, multiply by 0.6. Then you add those two numbers together to get your mean arterial pressure. There are other ways to calculate mean arterial pressure. I am aware of them. This is the one that causes the fewest mistakes on the lab exam. Please use this one. This is the one I will use to make my answer key. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure. Cardiac output, you now should know that we can calculate this using two different equations. As blood goes from your aorta to a muscular artery, to an arterial, to the capillary beds, this pulsatile <coughs> phenomenon of pressure starts to dampen. We don't go from 120 to 80, 120 to 80 throughout all of our vasculature. As the blood flows through the different types of blood vessels, this pulsatile nature becomes more streamlined, more even. That's important, most notably for the sake of the capillaries. Remember, they have a tunica intima, no tunica media. Their tunica ex externa is basically just a sheet of protein that we call a basal lamina. If they had to withstand pressure of 120 to 80, they'd be sheared to bits. There'd be nothing left of them. 
So by the time the blood gets to the capillaries, <clears throat> not only do we need to get rid of this pulsatile nature, but the intensity needs to be reduced so that the capillaries are not sheared to bits. And when I first started working here, when I first interviewed here for a part-time job, Mac was not even two weeks old. I know. And you all saw my precious little one last week, didn't you? He was not even two weeks old. He was a lot sweeter back then. <laughs> <clears throat> and the analogy that I used for this was better back in those days because my kids were young and they weren't manly man like children anymore. So I want you to go back in time and think of Mac as being just this little guy and also my oldest kid Hayden just this little guy. Both both my kids, in fact all of us <laughs> We're big soccer fans. You can't not, you, can't, you, can't, you have to be a soccer fan if you marry a British man. Yeah. You ha, you ha, it's, it's requisite. You really do. It's mandatory. My honey was born in England, and he was born near Manchester. <coughs> He's a devil. So our soccer club team is Manchester United, not Man City. Back when the boys were younger, there was this very famous soccer player. Perhaps you've heard of him. Ronaldo? Yes? Did all the underwear commercials. <clears throat> and he used to play for Manchester United before he got traded. And I love watching him take a penalty kick. He is fierce and very calculated. And he comes up to the ball and he starts running, but then he'll do a little stutter step. And a lot of other soccer players have since taken this technique, copied it from him. And he does the stutter step because he wants to throw the goalie off mentally. You see, the goalie has one of four choices. Up right, up left, low right, low left. They have a 25% of guessing right. And if the player, as they approach the ball, can throw off their body language, the goalie starts to second guess which way they should go. And Ronaldo had that down to his science. So he'd come up and he'd stutter step and then boom! sail into the net. So I want you to think of my, my family, the four of us, staring down Ronaldo. Okay? He's not taking a penalty kick. He's coming at us, and we're trying to defend the goal. I am not the goalie. Honey is not the goalie. Hayden is not the goalie. <coughs> okay? And we have little Mac. He's just a baby. We don't want him hurt. We don't want him hurt. Ronaldo doesn't care. We, <laughs> we got to protect Mac. So Ronaldo takes a, a big hit at the ball. Who should get that ball pegged at them first? And don't say me. Don't say me. You. <laughs> Who should get it first? Oh, honey. Honey. He's not the goalie, though. So he shouldn't be using his hands. And he's obeying those rules. So he heads the ball up. He deflects it. He gets the full force of the ball on his head. He deflects it. And if you've taken any sort of physics or have played pool at all, you should know that if you hit that ball, you're going to deflect it. Can you picture the ball going up? And now it's coming down again. Who should get it next? Me. Now, I'm still obeying the rules. I am not the goalie. I should not touch it with my hands. So I deflect the ball up again. Am I going to have as much of a headache as Honey might have? Why? Honey took off some of the force, didn't he? I'm still going to get hit pretty hard on my noggin. Who should get the ball next? 
Hayden. Now, Hayden is very protective of his brother. Rules be damned. Hayden catches the ball and passes it gently to his little brother. Now, I want you to think of Honey as the aorta, getting the full stroke volume, the full hit. It's going to dissipate some of that force. I am a muscular artery. I will dissipate the force even more. I'm dampening the force. Hayden is an arterial. Arterials, remember, have thick tunica medias compared to their diameter. Rules be damned. They are the resistance vessels. Hayden captures the ball. There is no more pulsatile up and down. There is just gentle one force going to baby McLean capillary bed. Good? Yes? Watch Ronaldo take a kick. You'll, you'll understand the analogy better then. So if I look at the pressure where it drops the most, not just the pulsatile nature, but the actual impact from the pressure, it drops the most during through I should say through the arterioles. That is the reason why they're called the resistance vessels. <clears throat> By the time we get to the capillaries, pressure still continues to drop, but it's not as steep. Pressure always has to drop from one vessel to the next. That's how we get blood flowing from one vessel to the next. Blood will only flow from high pressure to low. <clears throat> When we finally get back to the atrium, the right atrium in this example, pressure drops down to zero. The pulmonary circuit has its own series of pressure changes, but the pressure isn't as intense in the pulmonary circuit, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Through a capillary bed, we even see pressure differences. On the arterial side, the pressure can be about 35 millimeters of mercury. On the venous side, it can be as low as 10 millimeters of mercury, and Guyton Hall says a close average between that and the middle of the capillary is about 17 millimeters of mercury. You need to know about those pressures through the capillary bed. It is part of the forces I have to tell you about tonight. These forces are called starling forces. They are not imaginary forces. These are measurable forces. They have been studied in laboratories. I do not ask you to know their normal values. What I do ask you to know is a sense of their strength. I want you to know which of the four starling forces is the biggest, which is the lowest, and which two are in the middle. So don't memorize the numbers, but do know how to rank them in order of their intensity, from lowest to high or high to low. I'll explain that in just a moment. So here is our Ohm's law that's been modified again. Flow equals change in pressure over resistance. I've addressed pressure and pressure gradients being the driving force. Mean arterial pressure and how to calculate it, that's a driving force. But what about resistance? How do we calculate that? The answer is we don't. I won't ask you to calculate anything with resistance on the lab exam. We can't easily measure it. Rather, I want you to know what will happen if you know two out of the three, can you predict what the third would be like? Isn't this something I asked you to do in your first little lab exam? So if pressure stays the same, but I lower resistance, notice that resistance and flow are inversely related. If resistance goes down, flow goes up. If resistance goes up, flow will go down through a particular vessel. I ask you next week's exam to know this relationship. <clears throat> I will ask you to tell me what happens, not just systemically to flow through the body, 
but also what will happen through an individual blood vessel. Those are different concepts, and it's going to take some time to master them, which is why I'm pushing you so hard tonight for me to get through this lecture. The right ventricle does not have to create as high of a pressure as the left ventricle. And yet, they both have the same cardiac output. Have to. Have to be the same. They both have a stroke volume of 70 milliliters per minute. They both, both ventricles beat at the same time. They don't have different heart rates under normal healthy conditions. So they both have the same cardiac output. How is that possible if their pressure gradient is different? How can they have the same flow if their pressure gradient is different? The resistance has to be different as well. The pulmonary circuit, your, your, your lungs and the vessels that feed into them, robust with elastic tissue stretchable, very little resistance. Systemic circuit, more resistance, not as elastic. Not only that, but there are more vessels in the systemic circuit. And they can be vasoconstricted. So more vasoconstriction means more resistance to flow. In fact, the resistance in the pulmonary circuit is about one-seventh that of the systemic circuit. And that is the reason why the right ventricle can get the same stroke volume and hence the same cardiac output as the left. And it doesn't have to generate as much pressure. The resistance is lower. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about resistance. I'm going to go through the next four slides and we're gonna have another break. And that's a good break before we start to change concepts again. Poissouillet's law. <clears throat> you will, if you do your PhysioX before Wednesday, you will be analyzing the components of Poissouillet's law. Do not memorize the equation. On the lab exam, nor on next week's exam, will I ask you to calculate anything with Poissouillet's law. What I do want you to know is what factors of Poissouillet's law are in the numerator and which ones are in the denominator. Which ones are directly related to flow and which ones are inversely related to flow. Additionally, which ones are linearly related versus which ones are exponentially related? Poissouillet's law. Pressure is in the numerator. That means if pressure goes up, flow will go up if everything else remains the same in that equation. What's in the denominator? You're seeing this weird shaped L. The L stands for vessel length. The longer the blood vessel, the more resistance. Have you ever watched NASCAR racing? Yes. They just keep going in a circle. The more laps they have to, to make, the more likely they are to crash into the side rails, aren't they? Right? So if you have a longer blood vessel, the more likeliness that there will be for the blood to have turbulent flow, and that leads to resistance, okay? Do your blood vessels change in length from moment to moment? No, but clearly when you grow, they grew, but this is not a moment to moment change. So that factor for resistance stays pretty steady state. If your vessels do elongate, you will have more resistance, you will have less flow through that vessel. Also in the denominator, you're seeing a weird shaped N, that's a Greek letter, and it represents viscosity. Because it's in the denominator, it is also inversely related. If viscosity of your blood goes up, 
then you will have more resistance and that means flow will go down. What is the most numerous element in your blood? Formed element, sorry, I was not clear. Red blood cells. So what was the condition where we had more red blood cells than we should? Polycythemia. So a patient with polycythemia would have higher viscosity, and they, that means higher resistance, less flow. What was the condition where we have reduced oxygen carrying capacity? Anemia. And that could, could be caused from fewer red blood cells. And if it was caused from fewer red blood cells, then that means the viscosity would go down. That means resistance would go down and the person would have more flow. Radius of a blood vessel is in the numerator. And it's to the power of four. So this means that if radius goes up, that means the blood vessel is dilating then that means we get more flow of blood through it. But this is not a linear relationship. It's going to be exponential because it's to the power of four. Small changes in radius can have big impact on flow. And Poissouye said, out of all of these that I have characterized, radius changes moment to moment, has a big impact on flow, and so Poissouye said, I'm going to power of four. Big, big impact on flow. If radius goes from one to two, that's a doubling. Well, two to the power of four. Two times two is four. Times two is eight. Times two is 16. Flow rate will go up 16-fold if your radius doubles. If your radius is cut in half, then your flow rate will be 1 16th of the initial flow value. Small changes in radius, big impact on flow, huge. So viscosity, we talked about that. Your formed element that is the most abundant is red blood cell. But if viscosity goes up, flow through a vessel goes down. Vessel length. If the vessel is longer, you will have more resistance. Flow goes down. But viscosity and vessel length do not change from moment to moment. They don't. But the radius does. We're talking about the tunica media, contracting, causing vasoconstriction, or relaxing, causing vasodilation. That can change from moment to moment. And in unit two, you learned that the fastest way for us to change that from moment to moment is by provoking the sympathetic division, targeting the alpha-1 receptors. Yes? I'm just kind of confused about like, vasoconstricting like sympathetic. Okay. Thank you. Time out. Are we talking about flow systemically through the body or through a single <coughs> vessel? And that's where about five minutes ago I said those concepts are different. Do you remember me saying that just maybe five minutes ago? No, because everything's a blur right now. Watch the video. Back it up. I said those concepts are different. Let's address through your brachial artery. Local. Just here. Not systemic. If I vasoconstrict my brachial artery, will more or less blood go through that artery? Good. Good. So through a vessel, flow would go down. Now, let's revisit what Sarah just said for the sympathetic division, because she now was thinking for the whole body, weren't you? Okay. Let's set the scenario. You're swimming in the ocean. 
Mr. Great White Shark comes up and bites off your hand. Lots of bleeding, lots of bleeding, but you're gonna survive. But it's gonna take time to get you out of the water. It's gonna take time for us to get you to the hospital. <clears throat> lots of bleeding, even though we're trying to, to stop the bleeding. Lots of blood. What is happening to your blood volume? What is happening to your blood pressure? Dropping. Dropping. So at the initial point of time, blood pressure is dropping, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Blood pressure will drop, and then corrective mechanisms <clears throat> kick in. That's where you're entering with your sympathetic response, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So the sympathetic response, remember, is en masse, all together. That means we're going to have profound vasoconstriction in a lot of different places. Shunt the blood to the core, away from the periphery, to increase blood pressure. But listen, listen back toward normal. Remember, the hand bit off, blood, blood pressure dropping because of volume dropping. S sympathetic mo moment kicks in, corrective, trying to elevate blood pressure, restoring flow through the body. But it, it is not increasing blood flow through non-necessary structures, remember that? So if we're thinking local vasoconstriction, you're not gonna have as much blood flow through that vessel. If we're talking about trying to restore pressure because we've had some sort of injury or shock, we're trying to get blood pressure back to where it should be to restore pressure. Do you think you can go on indefinitely in that state? Eventually, you're going to need medical attention. We're going to have to get those blood vessels to go back to their steady state, not a corrective measure. Is that a little bit better? And again, that's on Wednesday's test. I bold and underline, consider blood flow through the brachial artery, a local vessel. <laughs> then other questions, I, I, I phrase it like, consider someone who has been training for a marathon in the heat of Arizona. They've been sweating excessively. What will happen to their blood volume? Go down. What will happen to their blood pressure? Go down. What corrective mechanism should kick in? Sympathetic division. But that's correction for a deviation. That's not what we're thinking about the whole body en mass versus me saying, think of a local vessel. Yeah, no, it's important. And, thank, and that's why I thanked you for asking the question. It's important. And I believe there are some questions that are like that in your homework packet, aren't there? Where it talks about someone who's going into shock of some sort. There should be at least a question in there. Just going to recap through vasoconstriction decreases blood. Through a vessel. Vasoconstriction, when we're talking about a sympathetic moment, as a corrective mechanism will help restore pressure, which is the driving force for flow through our body. Those are two different scenarios that we're talking about now. And on the test, I'm clear. Consider a blood vessel. Consider this patient in this problem. They have had significant blood volume loss. What will happen to their pressure? What corrective mechanisms would you expect? That is all about Wednesday's lecture on cardiovascular problems. We will go through different kinds of shock. And I will tell you about some really gnarly experiments that were done on dogs to explore how our body corrects for shock. And it's written about in Guyton and Hall. Not that you all open it and read it, but it is described in there, and it's 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 kind of, it, it makes me turn green, even when I lecture on it. It's it's pretty nasty, but medicinally, 
we get value from doing those experiments. We know then how to better treat people when they're in these types of scenarios. <clears throat> so let's, this is the last slide before I send you on another break. Flow. Flow is directly related to pressure and inversely related <coughs> to resistance. On Wednesday's exam, you need to pay attention. Am I asking you about blood flow through a singular vessel? Or am I asking you about corrective mechanisms that are happening in a patient that is experiencing shock? Those are different concepts. And I will go through it again on Wednesday in more detail. In order for blood to flow through a vessel, there has to be a pressure gradient. High pressure on one side, low pressure on the other. Blood will only flow from high pressure to low. The forms of resistance, length, viscosity, do those change from moment to moment? Nope, but radius does. And if radius goes down, resistance goes up, and through a blood vessel, we would not get as much flow. When we get vasoconstriction, because we initially had a drop in pressure due to some sort of shock, then the sympathetic nervous system is doing a corrective response, trying to bring pressure back up to restore flow. Those are different scenarios. Okay, go have a... Quick break, come back at 9.30.